Hello and welcome to St. Anne's Episcopal Church in Trexler Town. This is the second part of our Advent reflections on the Incarnation. Just heard the hymn, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent. Hopefully the number of people have commented that uh, it's hard to hear the organ, so I have it turned up. So hopefully you could hear that song and, and reflect on its, its music and its words. John in his prologue says and relates to us the reality of Jesus, the Son of God becoming man, and the Word became flesh. And flesh is what we will reflect on today. Flesh is not a pretty word, and it was not meant to be pretty or theological in a really uh, you know, out there kind of way, it was meant to be very, very much graphically describing the fact that that second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, became human, exactly like we are. And we reflected a little bit on what that reality meant, but when you think of flesh, um, and we hear it, let all mortal flesh keep silent, you know, do we listen? 
Are we quiet and do we listen? Do we know how to listen? So what is it that we can learn about ourselves as human beings from the Son of God made man? You know, flesh throughout its entire history has been seen as a bad thing. Um, for the most part, you have saints and sinners all writing about flesh and how it, 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 it just is at war with the soul and it's such a bad thing. And, and of course, that, that speaks of our bodies, our words, our actions, our physical presence on earth. And it, it, it spills over to the material things of uh, the earth also, goods and wealth and other kinds of things. But we're really pretty much going to reflect on our bodies, our life in a physical form. What we do and how we live certainly creates the world about us, or at least impacts it. And throughout our history as human beings, from the time of Genesis all the way through the time of now, it just seems that a lot of times our words and our actions create and sustain a cesspool of toxicity. And that's where we kind of see ourselves mired in the flesh and, and in that horrible place. And that's not where God created us to be or calls us to be. It's something we create on our own. And many people choose to remain there. And with the liberation that comes through Jesus' salvation, through his teaching, through his helping us to understand life here on earth, people stay there. So how do we spend our lives? How do we use our words and our actions? What do they say about us? Do we draw people close or do we push them away? Do we gather or do we scatter? Do we lift up or do we push down? Do we offer compassion or do we strike out? Words of comfort do we offer or words of hate and division? Sins of the flesh. And maybe a thought or reflection more apt for um, Lent. But it also has its application now. And that brings us to the eighth chapter of John. It's a great, great encounter and a great lesson. And it deals with the flesh. It deals what it means to be human and where things are in the mind of God. So in the eighth chapter of John, we hear the, the, the recounting of the woman who was caught in the act of adultery brought to Jesus by all these people indignant at her behavior because it was such a bad thing that she did. And so when they do this with Jesus, he doesn't act or react or speak right away. But eventually when he does, he kind of does as the divine physician, he does some triage. It's the worst first. That's if you're in a hospital or seeking a doctor, they take those people most in need of medical attention first. So it's the worst first. And it's not the woman. It's the others. Their judgment that they have imposed. Now, right or wrong is irrelevant because people argue, well, they're right. Well, on some level, but on the rest of it, they're wrong because Jesus attracts uh, or focuses his attention on them first because they have publicly humiliated this woman, dragging her through the streets and seeking in a very public way, in a public square or plaza, to, to have her stoned because that's the law. Public humiliation. How are they living their lives? One of the questions you have to ask is, where's the man? By definition, for adultery, you need two. Not even present. So they've made another judgment, and they've really taken this whole angst out on this woman. 
So we know the story where Jesus addresses them first and says, let those without sin cast the first stone. Sin for Jesus and sin for us is not a problem. If we can admit it, recognize it, and seek its forgiveness. So these anger-filled, judgment-filled, wrath-filled, where's the spirit? People go away one by one. And Jesus is left with the woman. No doubt what she did. There's never a question of that. Worst first. And not to belittle what she did. But how does God deal with us when we are not necessarily where we should be in living our physical lives? He forgives her and sends her on her way. That's an oversimplistic way of looking at it, but it actually gets the point across that that gospel is teaching us and what it means to be people of the flesh. So many times we spend so much energy condemning. And, you know, though oftentimes, you say, well, you know, we're right. Look at this in the scripture. Look at this in the Bible. Look at what this says. You know, and we lose track of the the toxicity that we bring into the world there's going to always be fault and flaw and what those people did not look at until jesus reminded them was <laughs> they were flawed too that's not a problem because god sent us a savior to live among us and with whom did jesus spend a lot of his time he spent it with the sinners and the tax collectors. He spent it with a group of people, his disciples, who were really not as faithful to him as they could be. You know, a cast of characters that they certainly weren't like the well-educated, well-groomed people who were supposedly prepared for a life of, of ministry and sharing the word of God. He did that. But he did that with an ordinary group of people. And I think that that's from where then when we move on from this, this passage of John 8, let's talk about a different woman. Let's talk about Mary. What was it about her? What was it about this young, very young woman that really allowed her to accept the visitation of the angel? And most of us would say, wow, that was a dream. That was an incredible dream. Or am I kind of nuts? Or was somebody pulling a prank on me? You know, was there somebody outside making that, you know, because that doesn't happen all the time. And so the question that stuff would be natural and normal. What was it with about her that that was different? Well, you know, obviously the the uh, someone pulling a prank or us having an illusion is very different than, a, a, you know, an angel coming to visit us. But still. You know, how many times do we see in the Old Testament there's a visitation of an angel and, you know, things don't always go well? And not only that, what allowed her to do something she couldn't completely understand? How can this be since I do not know man? She didn't get the whole picture. She didn't have everything to satisfy every question. And you know what? She really didn't even raise many of the questions that most of us would. And how many times do we question in our faith, so many things so that we can feel so confident before we decide to be so nice and generous and that we'll do something, but only something. But she didn't. She didn't understand it completely. And she had to know on some level that this was going to change her entire life. Oh, just a visitation from an angel alone. Let that just be the only thing that would change your entire life, would it not? It would mine. That's certainly reality. But what it was, what it all comes down to, was her faith. Interestingly enough, for the people of her time and people of her faith, number one, she wasn't a man. She was a woman. Think about how they treated the woman in the story we just talked about. She was a kid in many ways, and of course, in their time and their place, young woman, and I don't mean to detract, but it, she wasn't 40, 50, 60 years old either. She was a young woman, but what she was was a person of faith. And that allowed, by her opening her heart in faith and not having to know all the details and not having to control everything, 
and not having to make all these conditions. Does that sound familiar, the way we approach religion and faith sometimes? What that did was she was greater than all the religious leaders of that time and the elders because of that level of faith. How many of those people then, as we see, as Jesus does grow and lives and preaches, they become opposition? So her faith is greater than all those people. And such a young person. You don't have to be going to church for 30 years before you can live a great faith. God gives us to that, that gift to us, and it's there. And we should never discount our youth. We should never discount a person who is new to our community. Regardless, it's faith. And she was the vessel in her flesh. Back to that, because that's what we're talking about. And that's really what all this is about. In her flesh, salvation came to us. She wasn't the Savior, but there wouldn't have been a Savior without Mary. Faith continues. The will of God continues. And yes, Jesus has won for us salvation. But he still intends that through us, through our flesh, through our lives here on earth, that that salvation be brought to all people. And isn't it funny how many Christian groups want to withhold that? Well, if you're not a part of our church, you're not saved. But God's love is for us. It's so tragic. Like even in our recent history here in America or here in this part of Pennsylvania, even in Allentown or wherever it is that you might be from, maybe you've experienced the same thing. You know, you couldn't go down the streets of any town without finding 10 bars and 10 churches. And each of the churches, whether they were the same denomination or not, don't go to that church. Why? You know, my friend in school goes to that church. They're a good person. Well, they're not us. And there was a whole, and continues to be a whole set of divisions that we create physically that separate us from our sisters and our brothers. And we don't have to agree with what people believe. Hey, anybody in any congregation that gets together in the same worship service, you're not going to find any two people who believe exactly alike, let alone if you go to another denomination or if it's an ethnic thing or whatever. But among ourselves, don't we create that toxicity? You can't marry somebody from that church. Or how we look upon people who may not attend very often. Are we their judge or are we their sister or their brother? How do we live our lives as people in the flesh, as human beings? Now, what happens is when we're born, we're born only knowing really our physicality. You know, as, as infants, we know that we're hungry, we need to be changed, we, you know, we know things like that. And as we, we grow as children, again, we be, we're very self-centered. But life and maturity and faith teaches us to move gradually beyond that. And so those people who are still wrapped up in themselves, it's just simply they, they need to grow up. They need to mature. But we get to know our soul through how we live. And what we find is, is we find the fact that no matter how much we satisfy the flesh, we're never completely satisfied. There's never enough. Because that's when we encounter the, the flesh and the soul wind up saying, you know, what is there? What more to life can there be than having a full belly, a full bank account, and a full garage or whatever? You know, because those things can be nice, but they're not evil in and of themselves. But then the spirit comes to us and says, there's something more. Okay, what do we do with all this stuff? And we get to know the soul. We get to know our spirit. And that's where we find meaning. And we find permanence because it comes from God. If we go back and we look at the imagery that's in Genesis about creation, you know, we're, we're made of the dust and of the dust we shall return. But it's that eternal life of God that God shares with us when he creates us 
in his image and likeness that is the most important part, who we are. And we come to hopefully know ourselves better through our lives in the flesh, but understanding our spirit, our soul. There's something more to life. And that is what really connects us to God and to each other. So flesh is really, we're here for a time to learn, to grow, to allow our souls and our lives to mature if we have faith like Mary. And look at the difference that her simple, an insignificant woman in an insignificant part of the world by all measures, in an insignificant time, her faith changed everything. No, certainly, yes, Jesus did. But she was a part of that. And so were we. One of the terms or the titles, if you will, that they give Mary is the God bearer. And certainly, literally, physically, that's true. But I would say that really she was the God bearer in a more profound way and not to lessen her motherhood. It was incredible as it is. An even greater way. She bore God long before the angel came to visit her, or she would not have been able to respond. We are God bearers too. And how do we live our lives? Use of our lives for others. We see Mary, we see Jesus. We've got to move away from the toxicity we create to the joy of life. What's one of the major themes of, of Advent is joy. Comfort and joy and all that thing. You don't want me to sing. But joy. Joy can't just come from the physicality, the flesh. It comes when that is in harmony with the soul, which is in harmony with God and with each other as best we can be. And whatever deficiency exists, that's why we have Jesus Christ. That's the love of God that comes to us that says perfection is, is great, you know, strive for it. But when you fall short, I'm here all the time. All those kind of terrible things that we bring about, they weary us. They make us tired. They weary the soul. The conflict, the drama, the selfishness, the division, we create that. My favorite hymns, the soul felt its worth. Do we really comprehend how wonderful it is that God created us and who we are with all of our faults and with all of our failings and they'll make a difference. So as we pray, as we end our time together for today, that we may more and more understand and experience and really feel the worth of our soul through Jesus Christ that we seek to know better this Advent as well as ourselves, then when we do, when we feel more of that worth as we live it, let us also share it. There'll be one more Advent Forum next week. I invite you to join, to pray and to reflect as we listen and we reflect on God's great gifts to us, especially and particularly in this season of Advent as we prepare for Christmas. May God bless you and thank you again for coming together as sisters and brothers to share the word of God. May God bless you.
Thank you. 